here on chapter 5. I hope you're enjoying the book so far. This chapter is long and will be in two videos. Chapter 5. The Melting of the Lipid Hypothesis Nutritionism is good for the food business, but is it good for us? You might think that a national fixation on nutrients would lead to measurable improvements in public health. For that to happen, however, the underlying nutritional science and the policy recommendations, not to mention the journalism, based on that science would have to both be sound. This has seldom been the case. The most important such nutrition campaign has been the 30-year effort to reform the food supply and our eating habits in light of the lipid hypothesis, the idea that dietary fat is responsible for chronic disease. At the behest of government panels, nutrition scientists, and the public health officials, we have dramatically changed the way we eat and the way we think about food in what stands as the biggest experiment in applied nutritionism in history. Thirty years later, we have good reason to believe that putting the nutrients in charge of the menu and the kitchen has not only ruined an untold number of meals, but has also done little for our health, except very possibly to make it worse. These are strong words, I know. Here are a couple more. What the Soviet Union was to the ideology of Marxism, the low-fat campaign is to the ideology of nutritionism. Its supreme test and, as is now becoming clear, its most abject failure. You can argue, as some diehards will do, that the problem was one of faulty execution, or you can accept that the underlying tenets of the ideology contained the seeds of eventual disaster. At this point, you're probably saying to yourself, hold on just a minute. Are you really saying the whole low-fat deal was bogus? But my supermarket is still packed with low fats, this and no cholesterol that. My doctor is still on me about my cholesterol and telling me to switch to low fat everything. I was flabbergasted at the news too, because no one in charge, not the government, not the public health community, has dared to come out and announce, um, you know, everything we've been telling you for the last 30 years about the links between dietary fat and heart disease, and fat and cancer, and fat and fat, well, this just in. It now appears that none of it was true. We sincerely regret the error. No, the admissions of error have been muffled and the mea culpa is impossible to find. But read around in the recent scientific literature and you will find a great many scientists beating a quiet retreat from the main tenets of the lipid hypothesis. Let me offer just one example, an article from a group of prominent nutrition scientists at the Harvard School of Public Health. In a recent review of the relevant research called Types of Dietary Fat and Risk of Coronary Heart Disease, a Critical Review, the authors proceeded to calmly remove, one by one, just about every strut supporting the theory that dietary fat causes heart disease. Hu and his colleagues began with a brief, uninflicted summary of the lipophobic era that is noteworthy mostly for casting the episode in the historical past. Quote, During the past several decades, reduction in fat intake has been the main focus of national dietary recommendations. In the public's mind, the words dietary fat have become synonymous with obesity and heart disease, whereas the words low-fat and fat-free have been synonymous with heart health, end quote. We can only wonder how in the world such crazy ideas ever found their way into the public's mind. Surely not from anyone associated with the Harvard School of Public Health, I would hope. Well, as it turns out, the self-same group, formerly enthralled to the lipid, lipid hypothesis, was recommending until the early 1900s, when the evidence about dangers of trans fats could no longer be ignored, that people reduce their saturated fat intake by switching from butter to margarine. Though red flags about trans fats can be spotted as far back as 1956, when Ansel Keys, the father of the lipid hypothesis, suggested that rising consumption in hydrogenated vegetable oils might be responsible for the 20th century rise in coronary heart disease. But back to the critical review, which in its second paragraph drops this bombshell, quote, it is now increasingly recognized that the low-fat campaign has been based on little scientific evidence and may have caused unintended health consequences. End quote. Say what? The article then goes on to blandly survey the crumbling foundations of the lipid hypothesis, circa 2001. Only two studies have ever found, quote, a significant positive association between saturated fat intake and risk of CHD, coronary heart disease, end quote. Many more have failed to find an association. Only one study has ever found, quote, a significant inverse association between polyunsaturated fat intake and CHD, end quote. Let me translate. The amount of saturated fat in the diet may have little, if any, bearing on the risk of heart disease, and evidence that increasing polyunsaturated fats in the diet will reduce risk is slim to nil. As for the dangers of dietary cholesterol, the review found, quote, a weak and non-significant positive association between dietary cholesterol and the risk of CHD, end quote. Someone should tell the food processors who continue to treat dietary cholesterol as if a matter of life and death. Surprisingly, the authors wrote, there is little direct evidence linking higher egg consumption and increased risk of CHD. Surprising because eggs are particularly high in cholesterol. 
By the end of the review, there is one strong association between a type of dietary fat and heart disease left standing, and it happens to be precisely the type of fat that the low-fat campaigners have spent most of the last 30 years encouraging us to consume more of, trans fats. It turns out that, quote, a higher intake of trans fats can contribute to increased risk of CHD through multiple mechanisms, end quote. To wit, it raises bad cholesterol and lowers good cholesterol, something not even the evil saturated fats can do. And it increases triglycerides, a risk factor for CHD. And it promotes inflammation and possibly thrombogenesis, clotting. And it may promote insulin resistance. Trans fat is really bad stuff, apparently, fully twice as bad as saturated fat in its impact on cholesterol ratios. If any of the authors of the critical review are conscious of the cosmic irony here, that the principal contribution of 30 years of official nutritional advice has been to replace a possibly mildly unhealthy fat in our diets with a demonstrably lethal one, they are not saying. The paper is not quite prepared to throw out the entire lipid hypothesis, but by the end, precious little of it is left standing. The authors conclude that while total levels of fat in the diet apparently have little bearing on the risk of heart disease, the ratio between types of fats does. Adding omega-3 fatty acids to the diet, that is, eating more of a certain kind of fat, quote, substantially reduces coronary and total mortality in heart patients, and replacing saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats lowers blood cholesterol, which they deem an important risk factor for CHD. Some researchers no longer do, pointing out that half the people who get heart attacks don't have elevated cholesterol levels, and about half the people with elevated cholesterol do not suffer from chronic heart disease. One other little grenade is dropped in the paper's conclusion. Although a major purported benefit of low-fat diet is weight loss, a review of the literature failed to turn up any conceiving evidence of this proposition. To the contrary, it found some evidence that replacing fats in the diet with carbohydrates, as official dietary advice has urged to do since the 1970s, will lead to weight gain. Ugh. I have dwelled on this paper because it fairly reflects the current thinking on the increasingly tenuous links between dietary fat and health. The lipid hypothesis is quietly melting away, but no one in the public health community or the government seems quite ready to publicly acknowledge it. For fear of what, exactly? That we'll binge on bacon double cheeseburgers? More likely, that we'll come to the unavoidable conclusion that the emperors of nutrition have no clothes and never listen to them again. In fact, there have been dissenters to the lipid hypothesis all along. Lipid biochemists like Mary Enig, who has been sounding the alarm on trans fats since the 1970s, and nutritionists like Fred Kumaro and John Yedkin, who have been sounding the alarm on refined carbohydrates also since the 1970s. But these critics have always trouble getting a hearing, especially after 1977 when the McGovern guidelines effectively closed off debate on the lipid hypothesis. Scientific paradigms are never easy to challenge, even when they begin to crack under the weight of contradictory evidence. Few scientists ever look back to see where they and their paradigms might have gone astray. Rather, they're trained to keep moving forward, doing yet more science to add to the increments of our knowledge, patching up and preserving whatever of the current consensus can be preserved until the next big idea comes along. The closest thing to such a figure we have had is not a scientist, but a science journalist named Gary Tropes, who for the last decade has been blowing the whistle on science behind the low-fat campaign. In a devastating series of articles in an important new book called Good Calories, Bad Calories, Tobes has but all but demolished the whole lipid hypothesis, demonstrating just how little scientific backing it had from the very beginning.